Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figured Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and check it out, it's Star Wars plane. That's uh, from the Japanese Airlines ANA. I just happened to randomly see that. I didn't actually fly on that. But uh, back in October of uh, 2017, I got to go to Tokyo for free. I got a free flight and free hotel and just got to go hang out and check out part of the downtown city. But mostly I hung out down in Yokosuka, which is where Shenmue takes place. I swear that's just a coincidence. Um, then you can just see all this random. This is just Japan being Japan. That's a little alcohol. That Like, that's booze, but it looks like a juice sippy cup type of thing. I, I just found that amusing to me. Um, but anyway, so I, I just decided I wanted to go out and do some shopping. As you guys perhaps saw, I did. I went to Super Potato and Akihabara, and I went to the book offs in the area, but I also wanted to go to Hard Off. Now, Hard Off is a store I had never been to. Hard Off is a sister chain of Book Off. In fact, there's a whole lot of different chain stores that are in that, I guess, same entity, which you'll see a little bit of. But Hard Off is one I never got to go to because they don't have them in Osaka. And the only other time I ever went to Osaka was, or to Japan was Osaka. But you can see there was a Hobby Off and Off House, and like there's just a whole bunch of different weird ones in that weird family of. Uh, stuff and i decided to hit up as many of the hard offs as i could in that area which would usually involved of course taking the train nothing is accessible really by foot unless it's near your hotel uh and don't even think about trying to drive anywhere that's that's a madman's uh in like plan like it's not a good idea you take the train the train systems are fantastic uh google and uh different apps will definitely help you in that process but hard off but basically is is a um a used media store, uh, kind of like a high-end Goodwill, specifically for electronics is kind of the best way to put it. Um, people donate this stuff or resell this stuff, and, you know, Hard Off kind of takes the best of the best and puts it out in certain areas, and then anything they don't really want to deal with, they just put in big junk bins. Now, that doesn't actually mean these things are junk and that they don't work, it just means they don't have much value to them. So, for example, you sell, like, whole bins full of games there. Those are labeled junk, not because they're broken, but because they don't want to take the time to clean them and put them all out and everything, because a lot of them are, like, sports games, or, well, not sports games, but, like, what they consider commons. And the weird thing to us is that their commons are usually the really good games, like a lot of the Dragon Quest games, Final, you know, Final, uh, Final Fantasy. Look at that, Muzzle Flash, that is a Japanese OG Xbox exclusive, and there it was, like, pennies for that. Um, and that's just some of the games. Like, trust me, you'll see more games. But they also have hardware everywhere, as you can see, hence the name Hard Off. They have uh, controllers everywhere. Look, there's the Steel Battalion controller. That's basically 50 bucks for the controller right there. It's called junk, but it's not really junk. They just don't want to deal with it. Now, that they also, because they call it junk, you, don't, you can't return stuff, and it's your problem once you own it. But look at this. So much weird stuff. For example, this. This is a Japanese PSX. I did a video on this, but this one's silver. I didn't even know there was a silver one. I thought it only came in white. Uh, a Super Famicom. It's yellowed, therefore it's considered junk. Um, PlayStation 2s. There's a blue one, a white one, the regular black one. All sorts of Game Cubes, and just there's so much crap there, man. It's sick. Um, now most of this footage of this particular hard off is from that one where you saw like I was walking into the store. It's that one. But I, I got footage at multiple hard offs and I just kind of compiled it all together so you guys could get a sense of what these things are like. Now over here is where their nicer consoles are. These are the ones that they've taken the time to clean up or, you know, repackage and test and all that kind of stuff to be sure that they're functional. Um, so prices with that can vary. Um, they're if you're not sure of the conversion rate, uh, it's basically 108 yen to a dollar, and that, that can fluctuate, but the other way to think of that is uh, 100 yen is basically 89 cents. So if you look at like 32.40, that's going to be around 30 bucks. Um, same with that Wii U, and you're like, what? Well, wait, a Wii U for 30 bucks? It didn't have the gamepad, and I would have gotten it except gamepads are region locked, so I was like, ah, eh, the hell with that, I can't use it then. Um... But yeah, so you can see, like, these are the stuff they take better care of, and it's, it's nice to see all this kind of cool stuff. And even those prices are typically cheaper than it would, of course, to cost uh, cost us to actually take the time to import them. Now, they also have games. Uh, a lot of the rarer games or the stuff that's at least in obviously better shape, uh, they put out in different areas. What I noticed is uh, an interesting trend. So when I was in Osaka, that might have been the freak, because in Osaka, I there are no hard-offs. This chain doesn't exist there. Only Book Off. As a result, Book Off tends to have a ton of great inventory there. But what I noticed is that Book Offs in the Tokyo area didn't have nearly as good of an inventory. Not to say they had bad inventory, it just wasn't as good. And I get the feeling it's because Hard Off, for some reason, gets all the stuff first. I don't really know. But uh, Hard Off had way better inventory in the handful of places I went. 
Now, you have to understand, book-offs and hard-offs are extremely common. Um, like, it, I couldn't, couldn't even come close to visiting all the ones, even in my area, because they're basically, there's basically one or two at, like, every single train stop on every single train line. <laughs> you know, like, it's sick. Um, Tokyo is just way too big, and we were, and we were just down, like, south in uh, the Yokosuka area, like, downtown proper uh, Tokyo, we only went to one book off and one, uh, no, and one hard off and they weren't very good. They were like way overpriced, uh, by comparison of all the other places. So, um, again, if I were you, I would never shop in downtown Tokyo. The place to shop is always out in the burbs, man. Like where I am in this video is like way the hell out of your way. Like you'd have to go, you have to go pretty far South of Tokyo and then pretty far, uh, East of it. And you get off at this like random, I think in this case it was Chigisaki or Chigasaka or something like that. I got off there and then I walked for like a couple of miles to this hard off. And I'm like, you know, I'm walking around. And I get a lot of people staring at me like, okay, why is there a foreigner way the hell out here? Like, there's no reason I should be there. It's like, yes, there is. This is where the good hard offs and the good book offs are that pe basically my people haven't come and like, you know, thrift uh, went all through and kind of destroyed and taken all the shit out of. So it was kind of cool. Like that's, I mean, you know, I'm kind of doing my, you know, digging my own grave here basically, but that's my recommendation for you. If you're going to Japan and you want to buy stuff, don't, don't waste your time in like downtown Tokyo. Like you're not going to, you'll see cool stuff, but you're not going to buy things there because it's too expensive. And the best bargains are all to be had out in the rural areas. Now, that can be intimidating, I'm sure, to a lot of you. It's like, but I don't speak Japanese. What am I going to do? I don't speak Japanese either, man. We live in a digital era. Your phone can get you anywhere. Just make sure you have a good data plan, uh, which is exactly what I did. Um, but, yeah, it's totally worth it, man, because then you get to, you get access to all this great stuff. And it's, it's usually very calm. As you can see, there's, like, nobody in the store. They don't give a shit if I'm filming or anything. And, you know, as long as you have, like, so I have a basic enough grasp of Japanese that I can at least, like, get through uh, an exchange of goods. Like, that's the stuff I've learned how to do. Maybe I'll talk more about that some other time, give you guys more tips if that's ever anything you're interested in. But, uh, yeah, uh, I think that's that's pretty much my biggest piece of advice is don't go to Tokyo to shop. If you go to Tokyo, just go there to use it as an airport and then go somewhere else. Um, yeah. But as you can see... More great stuff here, the rarities uh, behind the case there. A lot of PC Engine and uh, TurboGrafx, or sorry, TurboGrafx-16 would be PC Engine. Uh, Famicom games, uh, and then what else am I seeing? Mega Drive stuff, Saturn stuff. Of course, that's the rare the rare stuff. Uh, Neo Geo games. Uh, and then they also, I should have mentioned, like, look at that Japanese Virtual Boy. They also have a lot of different things at Hard Off that I didn't really bother showing you footage of. They have things like record players and sound systems and records, of course, and music like all sorts of music things and just general hardware like they sell bikes you might have noticed in the background there it's just video games is just one of the things they have there but because of the nature of my interests and because of this channel i thought that made the most sense to focus on but uh yeah you can see all sorts of great stuff little 3ds's ds's and you might have noticed it earlier there's a big junk bin full of ds's like if you had if you're like my buddy ronald for example i'm really afraid of him uh, in this case because what i think is going to happen like the if he ever goes to japan he his whole thing is he repairs broken consoles like that's his passion if he goes to a book off he's gonna like empty the motherfucker out <laughs> like and just take like everything in there because it all costs like nothing and he's gonna have like endless inventory of things to try and fix uh so sorry ronald if we ever go and i ruin you for some reason my bad um yeah this is a, a different hard off in a different area in case that wasn't obvious this one was pretty cool because it was multiple floors um but only the top floor was hard off the other floors were like hobby off and house off or off house or something like that um i'm obviously it's a it's like a weird translation thing and i'm sure a lot of you who don't know a whole lot about japan are like what is with the prevalence of english i mean i thought we were in japan why is it called hard off you have to understand that the japanese english is interesting it's like amusing to like they can read it and they typically have a better understanding of english than they let on um so they know what hard off is they know those words and they know where that what that place is and what that concept means it's just it's more like ooh, intriguing they, they find the west to be more like interesting as a spectacle and so it's kind of almost used as a marketing gimmick like hey this is kind of western isn't that cool you should come buy stuff here I know that that sounds kind of weird to us, but that's, you know, I'm sure all sorts of stuff we do is weird to them. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so 
This one was cool because it had a lot of games. And that's what I was saying about by comparing it to book off book offs usually are like this, at least in Osaka where they just have like giant game sections, the book offs in the Tokyo area, at least, well, in the area I was down more near Yokosuka again, didn't do as well on the games. They had some great items in a couple of cases, but, and if you go back, you can see all the pickups I got from the, the book offs I did. But in this case, this was the, uh, the one to watch because this you'll see, I got a lot of cool stuff at various hard offs. Uh, but of course, pickups will come towards the end of the, the video. But um, yeah, man, like just look at all this shit. Like there's so much cool stuff in there. Just you know, boxed Neo Geo games, uh, various boxed games for platforms we never even got, like Bandai Wonder Swan and uh, the rare games for that. You know, uh, various uh, Turbo Graph or sorry, PC Engine hardware, AV top loaders for NES, Core Graphics Two, Denji to Go controllers, um, and like the the gaming stuff just like never ends like there's just so much of it and this again this is the like good section this is the section where everything's like considered not junk there is still a junk section you're gonna see in a bit too uh xbox 360 og xbox xbox one uh gamecube stuff um as you can see there just tons of it original wii um i wouldn't even dare to get into that i mean i the wii is not my favorite console as i'm sure a lot of you know but I can't even imagine how hard it would be to get into the Japanese exclusives over there. The Wii U. The uh, Yakuza 1 and 2 HD pack right there. That's a Japanese exclusive. As is F1 Race right there. You saw that. Uh, at least physical editions um, are Japanese exclusives for the Wii U. Uh, PS3 stuff. Again, that's another thing that's really hard to get into. One thing that can be kind of unfortunate is that there's so many games that came out physically in Japan that we never got. That unfortunately in Japan didn't have any sort of English compatibility. But then there'll be, like, Hong Kong versions that do have English compatibility, but, you know, Hong Kong's in China. It's not part of Japan, so you, you don't see those here, of course. And that kind of always bothered me because it's like, dude, it's, it's all, we're basically in, like, the all-digital era. Why, why not just include English language on both since you've obviously made it, you know, and you release them at the same time? It's frustrating. You know, it's really frustrating. Um, but here you have uh, verified consoles, and uh, you can see all the prices on those. You know, uh, also come down to not just you know quality of the the reliability of it, but also like the color. Like so, if any like a console is yellowed, for example, they like automatically take money off of it, which is nice. Um, now here we're in the junk section. See again, junk. Note it's not necessarily junk. It's just they don't want to have to deal with it. Look, a Japanese PSX again. That's the white version. Again, I didn't even know there was a silver. That basically was like fifteen bucks. Um, which, if I didn't already own one, I would have bought one just to have it, even though it might not have worked. In fact, in the case of the PSX, it probably wouldn't work. Those things never, ever work. But, um, yeah, more and more bins full of just games. Um, again, these are usually commons, which makes sense. But their version of commons can really throw... Like, this is an entire row of Pokemon stuff. Like, I'm not a Pokemon dude, but I know a lot of you are. And, like, that's all those are. And each one's like a buck. You know, 89 cents, usually more accurately. A Famicom down here, just sitting there. That's about five bucks. Um, and then there's, you know, there's like a Super Famicom. That's about ten bucks. Maybe even the last one, more like nine. Uh, yeah, just tons of that stuff. And cartridge consoles are the best to get at places like this because cartridge consoles very rarely go broken. Saturn, about five bucks, maybe four fifty or so. Depends on if you're paying tax or not, uh, which depends on your nationality. Uh, and how much you spend because a, a lot of places will give you what's called tax free if you spend over fifty dollars um, or basically five thousand yen or fifty four hundred yen depending on which part of the country you're in and what store you're in you have to spend over that amount and then show them your passport and say tax free some stores will do it other stores will not I, f I had way more luck with it in osaka than i did in tokyo only like two stores in tokyo that i went to anyway honored it uh, I don't really know why, because the, they're mostly doing it in for the Olympics, and the Olympics are going to be in Tokyo, not Osaka, but whatever. Um, so yeah, and then here's yet another uh, hard off. You see all that? That's a Switch. That's a Switch for like 400, 420 bucks, something like that. Like, you know, they're inflating it because Switches are so uncommon over there and so highly sought after. But yeah, just more stuff. This one, I have to say, this particular hard off was totally worth going to because there was so much cool stuff in there but i could see why there was this um hard off was this is hard to describe for us to get to this store we had to i shit you not walk up a mountain 
like, you know, like, not like straight up, of course, there's like railings and, you know, a smooth concrete path, but you're essentially just walking up a steep incline the whole time. And then when you get to the top of the mountain, there's like this little, you know, uh, like suburban type of village up there. And then you go down the mountain and there's like this little valley full of more like suburban homes. And this was inside that suburban valley. Now, basically what I'm saying is like everyone in that area, this was like their only store to go drop stuff off because Japanese people don't typically throw stuff away. They're much more, uh, I guess, conservative about that. So they, they typically go and just try to get anything they can for it if they don't want it. So this area just had tons of stuff dumped into it. Every single one of those sealed, basically a buck. And that comes with the, the, it's a Japanese exclusive game called like Quiz something or other. Comes with a microphone for the GameCube. Ever since they had like a whole box of them. Anyway, so they would dump a whole bunch of stuff into this particular store, but nobody goes and shops in the store because they're all from that area. So basically, I came in. Like I got some Boss Coffee. I came in and I'm just like, oh yeah, I got I got some money to spend and I want to buy some Japanese stuff. And it's just you see so much great stuff in such great condition. And it's super cheap because of the, the location it's in. Like, anything in here in Tokyo would have cost you, like, two or three times as much. That's what I'm saying. Go to the rural areas. But it can be brutal. Like I said, had to walk up a mountain. Um, this is a totally different hard off out near that big Buddha I showed you guys. Oh, actually, was that? No, that wasn't in this video. The big Buddha thing was in a different video. But, yeah, I, I saw this big Buddha thing. It's the biggest Buddha in Japan, and I happened to just walk past it. I'm not a good tourist. I don't really care about the sights. I care about I'm going to eat the food. I'm going to look for the game stores and I'm going to get shit done. Like that's, uh, that's, I'm just going to relax and hang out. I don't like to see like, Oh look, the biggest castle in the history of ever. Like it, none of that stuff ever mattered to me. It's like, if I happen to walk past it, sure. I'll, I'll take a photo. Uh, I'm just a different type of tourist, but yeah, look, you know, like this again as uh, the junk section. So you got all sorts of like, a, you know, that's a Wii for like five bucks. Uh, I think that's the 60 gigabyte PS3 right there. Uh, I was looking for a 60 gigabyte Japanese PS3 for cheap. Um, but I wanted it to be guaranteed to work, which was the problem because they usually don't. Uh, because th then I could have played Japanese PS1, PS2, and PS3 games all on the same device. Um, while I found a couple, I was never found one for the right price. And I'm kind of glad I didn't do it because they would be really hard to bring back because they're so big and so heavy. But um, I ended up doing okay. Like the time, this time when I went out there, I brought a lot of suitcases. I actually put a suitcase inside of another suitcase. Like I, I planned ahead this time, unlike the first time where I, I very seriously underestimated how much crap I was going to come back with. But uh, you guys, I mean, you've seen some of it already, but uh, you will see at the end of this video the uh, the pickups and stuff. Oh, I'm sorry, Scott the Canadian. I just saw a Japanese Ghostbusters game in my own footage that I did not see when I was there. I'm sorry, dude. If I had seen that at the time, I would have grabbed that for you. Uh, well, see, that's that's another good reason to go back and watch my own videos, huh? Because I had no idea. Scott the Canadian, my buddy, big into Ghostbusters stuff. And there was a Japanese Ghostbusters 2 copy right there. I didn't notice it. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, my bad. But uh, anyway, so there you go. Just more and more stuff. And uh, this has, uh, this has just got so much crap. <laughs> Isn't it sick? And then there's like all these games you've never seen before and you had no idea that existed. Like that 1-48, it's like some sort of like Japanese date simulator with like real girls. And you're like, God, they got so much stuff over there that we never, ever, ever would have. But yeah, that's a quick look at the footage, and uh, now let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the pickup, shall we? So that was Hard Off, the ever-infamous Hard Off. How fucking awesome was that place? <laughs> so much cool shit. And as you can see, I did pretty well, and there's some stuff you're not seeing at the moment, but you will. Um, yeah, no, that place is obviously fantastic, and I absolutely killed it there. And it was really cool, man. Like, I, I brought two suitcases on this trip. Like, I literally packed one inside of another suitcase, uh, just so I could, you know, only have to ship one. And then when I got there, it was like, bam, two suitcases, plus a backpack, plus my laptop case. Let's do this shit. <laughs> um, and because uh, you guys saw, I bought some consoles and stuff. So, like, I filled up that space pretty quick. So, I'm, I'm glad I brought the additional space. Um, so, yeah, everything I got at, uh, at Hard Off. Let's do this. Um, first, big stack of GameCube games. GameCube games are very cheap over there. So, my general policy on it is I'm only going to get games that were Japanese exclusives to the GameCube. Uh, what that means is... A GameCube game that, on the GameCube anyway, only came out in Japan. So some of these games might have come out in North America, but like on the PlayStation 2 or something like that. I don't care about that. I want the GameCube version. Make sense? And a lot of these never came out of Japan anyway. This one would be probably a very good example of that. First up, Captain Tsubasa, Ugon Seda no Chosen. I don't know. But obviously some sort of soccer game. Or football. 
to our European friends and basically everyone other than Americans. Um, next up, Star Soldier, which I think is actually a remaster, or not a full-on remake, but a remaster of the Sega Saturn game. I could be wrong about that, but I, I'm pretty sure that's what that actually is. There's um, this is from like the Hudson like series. There were four games in this series, uh, like of different like re-releases, remasters. They did kind of like the Sega Ages thing. Um, this is the only one of them uh, that I have. Um, next up, uh, Dokapon DX. This is one of the more expensive ones. Um, I think I paid like thirty for this, but looking online, it, it goes for a lot more than that. Uh, GT Cube. Interestingly, this was brought to North America, but on the Wii, and I actually own it for the Wii. So I thought that title was very familiar, and I was like, what the hell? And I looked up, no, this was the Wii game. They added motion control garbage and stuff, but there was a non-motion control, like, quote-unquote, good version uh, available on the GameCube, so there you go. Uh, and then, of course, another very infamous Sega franchise we all know and love, uh, Gaikuto Professional Baseball. I don't, to, I don't even have to introduce it. You guys already know all about it. Uh, SD Gundam Gashapon Wars, uh, Gashapon being those like little cute capsule toy versions or whatever, like the chibi type of things. Uh, they made, make a game out of that, it's supposed to be like violent but not but look child friendly or whatever. Japan, man. Um, this is something GP Road to the Evolution. I think it's Cyber Racing Road to the Evolution, something like that. Uh, based off, I think, an anime, but it's basically like a, a F-Zero type of racing game. Um, then, this one I'm a little surprised didn't come out of Japan. Uh, World Soccer Winning 11-6 Final Evolution. This probably came out on the PlayStation 2, um, but at least for, as far as the GameCube is concerned, only in Japan. Uh, Momotaru Den Dentetsu 12. This one is a surprisingly uncommon title. It's also relatively expensive, I mean, all things considered. Um, a lot of the Hudson stuff tends to be, so cool to get that off the list. Um, and then finally, uh, Hikaru no Go 3. Um, this game actually, I, I don't know if... It has a lot of compatibility with a very specific Game Boy Advance game, probably of the same series. Um, I don't know if it originally came with the game, or if you're supposed to buy it, but there is a spot in the case for the Game Boy Advance game to be put right there. So part of me thinks, and I can't read Japanese, so I don't know if it says, like, hey, the Game Boy Advance game is included, um, or, or if you're supposed to buy it and add that in. If anybody knows, please tell me, because um, maybe I need to get that and put it in there, I don't know. But uh, that would be cool to know, if anybody could tell me. Uh, so there you go, Game Boy, or GameCube stuff. Now, also got a couple of games for the PC Engine. Um, which is probably one of these consoles that it, if I keep going to Japan, which that would be nice. I, I don't expect that to happen particularly often. This was a freak event that this happened at all. Um, but if I get to go back, one of the things I might want to start working on is like PC Engine stuff. Because as opposed to TurboGrafx-16, because it's so much cheaper there. It's so much more prevalent and everything. And usually because it's like the 16-bit era stuff, um, you know, all 4th gen games are usually the language barrier isn't much of a problem. Um, so this one was a bonus game. Uh, this is uh, some sort of Fire Pro Wrestling. I think it's like Fire Pro Wrestling Tag Champions or something like that. I don't remember exactly. I'll put the name up on the screen. But uh, yeah, it's just the card. And then the one I actually bought specifically because a buddy of mine I was hanging out with recommended it. Uh, this is PC Punknik Cyborgs. Turns out this actually came out in North America. But again, like I said, the language barrier thing doesn't really matter much. Um, this is a cool, like, run-and-gun shmup, sort of. It's like a combination of the two ideas. This was a lot of fun, uh, uh, from, what, from what I played of it. But, uh, yeah, very cool. Uh, also, I got a bunch of N64 stuff. Now, if you guys watched my uh, Osaka videos when I went there, uh, the thing that really surprised me the most was how much N64 stuff I ended up picking up. Because I, I had gone there not planning to get any. Um, but it turns out there was something like 80 exclusives for the N64 in Japan. And I ended up finding, because most Japanese N64 games are completely worthless in Japan. So I got most of them already. I think I bought like 50 of them when I was in Osaka. But uh, I thought, well, it'd be cool to track down as many of the remaining ones as I could. So in Book Off, I did okay. I, I found a couple. In Heart Off, I did better. I found more of them. But still, there's more on the list I haven't found. But these are the ones I got. The first one's a real shocker. SimCity 2000. Yeah, this game. This game came out of, like, everything under the sun, including the Super Nintendo. So it's really strange that the N64 version did not come out in North America or Europe. It only came out in Japan. 
Um, and I like the label, it says SimCity 2000. It's new, Nintendo 64 version. Something tells me that this was a very late release for the N64, although I don't know offhand, I could be dead wrong about that. But um, it's just, it's really strange to me that, um, that this came out only there. And on top of it, there is uh, a SimCity 64, like a uh, DD64 game. And the, I've checked, the two don't have compatibility together. Um, that would have been cool, but um, yeah, very, very odd. They must have had some sort of a s affection, I guess, for SimCity over there that perhaps Nintendo of America didn't. I don't really know. Um, this one I was, I, this one's funny. I didn't even realize this was an exclusive because I passed on this thing multiple times in Osaka, which was just me not paying enough attention to my own list, I guess. But this is uh, Masters 98 Augusta, which is just a golf game. Um, super cheap, which is great, but like, hey, good to get another one off the list. But I'm amazed I didn't realize that was exclusive. Uh, this is Jikyo, Powerful Pro, Yaku, Basic Bond 2001. It's a whole bunch of these games, like this whole baseball series with these like little chibi type of characters. This series has been going on for a long time, um, and it still goes, I'm pretty sure. Like, I, there's a ton of these on the GameCube, there's, um, I think, a bunch of these on the Wii. Um, I didn't see, I don't think there's any on the Wii U or the Switch yet. But uh, it might be a dead franchise. Oh, it's Konami. Yeah, it's a dead franchise. Never mind. But, um, yeah, so they were popular. This was the only one for the N64 I didn't have. So now I have all that. Little subset is done. Uh, then I've got Aide Yosuku no Mahjong Juku. I bet it's a fighting game. No, it's Mahjong. Um, but, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, J League Tactics Soccer. Choro Q2. This one was actually hard to find. I remember actively looking for this in Osaka. Um, the first one of these, Choro Q1, actually came out in North America as Penny Racers. I'm sure some of you guys know that game. But there was actually a sequel to it, only released in Japan. Um, and I remember looking for it a lot in Osaka and never finding it, at least at a good price. I found it for a few times for like 20, 30 bucks. And I was like, that's terrible. Why is that so high? Um, book off just a couple of bucks. Or, sorry, hard off a couple of bucks. And then this one, which I was sure I was not going to be picking up on this trip, because this is the single most, like, demanded one of all the Japanese exclusives. Uh, this is Sin and Punishment, a game I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with. This is probably, of all the Japanese exclusive N64 games, the one that people really scratch their head on why it never came out here. Um, even Nintendo probably regrets that decision, because... They actually, uh, the game is in Japanese, but they translated it into English, and you can actually buy this for a very brief time, it's almost over, on the Wii Virtual Shop, the eShop, not the eShop, the Virtual Shop for the Nintendo Wii specifically. Um, you could actually buy the N64 version on there, translated into English. So, like, they clearly finished it at some point, but they never bothered to release it onto a cartridge. I wouldn't be surprised at all if uh, the N64 Classic, whenever the hell that happens, it contains that same build, uh, an N64 complete English ROM of it, which will be great because then maybe eventually people will make repro cards or something with the N64 English version. I'm just thinking ahead, way ahead. But still, I wanted the Japanese version because that's what it actually exists, um, but it, every time I've ever seen it, it's, it's expensive. It's usually like in the $50 range. Um, that's just a loose card. In this case, there was a hard off that had it like this, with the box and the manual for 30. So I thought that was a pretty good deal, all things considered. So I decided to pull the trigger. So Sin and Punishment, nice to have. Uh, next up, got a whole bunch of Super Famicom stuff. Now, uh, I'm not going to lie to you, my choices in Super Famicom stuff was very motivated by one strange thing. Uh, so you have to understand, <laughs> if you saw my book off video from Osaka months ago, uh, I didn't pick up a whole lot of Super Famicom stuff, but some of the stuff I did was Sailor Moon based. And I, I don't give a shit about Sailor Moon, I don't care about anime in general, I'm sorry, I just don't. But the reason I wanted some of those Sailor Moon games was that I had an ex-girlfriend who was really into Sailor Moon. Um, and she, at one point we were playing like on an EverDrive or something, and she was playing through some of these Sailor Moon games. And she found one that she pulled up, and it was this really cool, like, Streets of Rage-style beat-em-up game. And I was like, this is really fun, which is weird, because it's Sailor Moon, and it's not something I have any real interest in. But it was a fun game, setting aside, like, the source material. So I wanted to find out what that game was. And unlike a smart person who would have just, like, Googled that information, I decided, because the cartridges were cheap, I just kept picking them up and hoping to find the right one. So when I got back from Japan the first time, I tried them all out, and I didn't have the right game. And I was like, fuck, all right, well, if I ever go back, I'll find out. So I went back, obviously, 
And I said, I'm going to do the same stupid thing. I'm going to try and round up all these like Sailor Moon games trying to find the right one. So did I succeed? Well, not in this case. Uh, this is uh, Panic in Nakayoshi World, which is some sort of, I think it was a puzzle game, a Sailor Moon puzzle game. And then I sort of succeeded. This is Bishouju Shenshi Sailor Moon. This is essentially the game I was talking about, but not quite. Because this was the actual one. This is Bishujo Shenshi Sailor Moon R. This is uh, the game I was describing a minute ago. Um, the R being like the, it has more content type of a version. It's the more advanced version. Um, this is a legit good game. I would recommend picking this up. You, know, you don't have to speak Japanese or anything. This is a fun beat em up style game if you like things like Streets of Rage games or if you like uh, the old Mighty Morphin Power Rangers games, like the good 2D beat em up ones. This is legit fun. Um, and I'm sure the only reason it never came out here was just Sailor Moon was never really that popular here. Uh, but this this is actually good. And then this one I bought, again, because I didn't know which one was going to be which. Uh, Bisujo Shinshi Sailor Moon Super S. Shuyaku Sudu Tetsu. I don't know. But uh, this is, I think, an RPG? But I, I really don't remember. Because um, once I found that one, I was like, alright, good, I'm set. But yeah, got a bunch of Sailor Moon crap on that basis. I know, I know, I know. I'm embarrassed too. Um, you can be, you don't have to be embarrassed for me. I already am. Uh, but next thing I got, and I was really happy to find this. Uh, this is RPG Sukuru 2, also known as RPG Maker 2. Um, now you're looking at it like this is a really weird shape for a cartridge. Uh, you're right. Super Famicom cartridges traditionally look like this. Why does this look like this? It looks more like the Game Boy Player. Well, you're close. Um, so if you guys aren't aware. Uh, there is there was an add-on in Japan for the Super Famicom called the Satellaview. Now, what it allowed it to do is it basically gave the console online capabilities. Not kind of the way we think of it now. It had different type of online capabilities where you could... It's really hard to describe because it was a very bizarre concept. There's a whole video is dedicated to it. But basically, any game that specifically utilized the uh, Satellaview would have this extra slot here. And then these extra slots, there were different type of cartridges you could put in them. And they would basically act as memory cards, allowing you to download essentially DLC, if you want to think of it that way, for the games designed in mind. Um, and some of the greatest ROM hacks and stuff that we found out there came through this Teleview of people who have those games sitting on these little cards they never bothered to delete. So these things are actually kind of neat. Um, I believe there were eight of these uh, Super Famicom Satellaview compatible games. And I think I now have seven of them. I think I'm just missing one, although I don't remember which one offhand. Um, this one would be I, probably the more common of the two. I've actually seen this multiple times since I got back from Japan. I saw this in Video Games New York. They wanted something like 10 bucks for it. I think I saw this in uh, St. Louis in a store down there. I think it was about 10 bucks, something like that. Um, I think I saw this at a convention. I think I saw this at Pink Gorilla in Seattle as well, about the same. Um, but I was like... I'm going to find it in Japan if I ever go back. It's just going to be cheaper. And it was. It was about a buck. Actually, this was less than a buck. This was 100 yen, which would be about 89 cents. Um, now, if you're questioning, like, well, is it just a coaster? Does it do nothing? You know, I mean, it, no, it's, it still is the actual game. Uh, it's just that there's the ability to add additional content to it, or there was. Now that that service doesn't exist anymore, it's just the original game in a weird shell. Um, unless you happen to have one of the original cartridges and still happens to have the original DLC data on it, if you want to think of it that way. But yeah, this was a thing. Um, the other weird Super Famicom cartridge I got, I kind of talked about my Super... I did talk about my Super Potato video. Now you can see it in person. The Sufami Turbo. Now I apologize to anybody who watched the Super Potato video and is watching this now, because you're about to hear me repeat a story. But if you're wondering what this is, the Sufami Turbo um, is a cartridge that Bandai created for the Super Famicom. The story with this basically goes that at the height of the popularity of the Super Famicom, aka Super Nintendo, the way it always works is a developer, when they finish their game, they give it off to Nintendo or they give it off to Sega or whoever, and they're like, okay, there's our game, please put it on a cartridge. And then Sega or Nintendo is responsible for actually building the actual cartridges. They're responsible for the entire hardware production. As you can imagine, that can be difficult. Uh, you'll have a long line of different developers demanding thousands and thousands and thousands of copies. It just, you know, if there's chip shortage or anything like that, you're completely screwed and it's your responsibility. Now, Sega sometimes played ball with that, but Nintendo really never does. Um, Nintendo's not in the habit of allowing other parties to represent any of their uh, interests. Um, but in this case, uh, I don't know what deal Bandai struck with them, but they basically probably told them something like, look, we want to bring a bunch of games to the Super Famicom. 
you guys have way too many games in your backlog. Let us put out some games. Let us handle it. Let us make our own cartridges. So for whatever reason, Nintendo agreed. So Bandai built this. Um, and it is it is a legitimate licensed Nintendo product. It's not like the Aladdin thing that uh, was put out, I believe it was in Europe, and I, I think it came out here as well for the NES that was not licensed, but it was the same concept. Um, this, this was officially licensed by Nintendo, and it had these weirder cartridges you'd put in, and once you put them in there, it's a Super Nintendo game. It just, it just looks different. Um, but yeah, that saved Nintendo the effort of having to do uh, cartridge production. Now, I found this, at, of course, a hard off, um, for four bucks. I was like, oh, that's, that's awesome, I'll get that. But I didn't expect to find any games for it, because the games for it are very uncommon. They're not valuable, they're just very uncommon. Um, and lo and behold, the next hard off I went to, I actually found two. I found these. I found, um, this is SD Gundam Generations 3 and 4. Uh, these are in the box, too, which is nice box complete. They have the manual and everything. I'll show you what the cartridges look like real quick here. Um, basically, this thing is neat. You know, it's got the manual there, and then the little cartridge, which looks... It's hard to even describe, like, equate that to anything. If I had to equate it to anything, this is going to be a weird comparison. Uh, the Amstrad GX4000 that only came out in the UK had cartridges very similar to this. Um, so to like the three people in the UK who have one, yeah, this is this th that gives you a good sense of reference. You guys can also like shout out the video, be like, yeah, he mentioned that thing. Right, so anyway, you plug it in here just like that, and that's your game. That it'll work in a Super Famicom just like that. Now if you're like, okay, what's the deal with the second slot? Well, because Bandai had 100% control of the device and all the software that came out on it. Uh, they could allow their games to be cross-compatible with each other and do different things. So here's a different game. This is Gundam Battle Generation 3. Now, what the console does is if you just have a cartridge in slot A, it'll just play that. Uh, if you put something in just B, it'll detect that you have something in B, but it'll tell you, like, you got to put something in A, I can't do anything else. Um, but if you have games that are compatible with each other, like these two are, It'll play game A, but it'll borrow additional data from game B. Basically, think of it as like, this is a bad example because I don't think this is exactly what happens. Let's pretend that this was like a fighting game, um, and this was a different fighting game for a different series. You could be playing this fighting game, but it'll attack this fighting game and say, oh, you're playing that, you have that one too? You get a bonus character in this game. You know what I'm saying? That's basically the concept. Um, ultimately, Bandai only put out 13 games for this thing. I actually now have seven of them. Two of which I got from this hard off. Each one was like four or five bucks, something like that. And then the ones I got at uh, Super Potato, which were like four bucks each. Um, like, they're not really valuable for the most part. They're just really uncommon because nobody had them. And nobody even really knows it exists. Um, in fact, this is probably the most uh, inclusive story on YouTube about the Sufami Turbo that I've seen anyway. And I'm, I barely, I'm just scratching the surface of the knowledge of this thing. So, yeah, it's, it is cool. Um, and if you're ever over there and you want to get one, it's a pretty cool thing to get in person. I wouldn't try buying this stuff online, though, because the people who sell them online sell them for a lot more money than I paid. But uh, there you go. Cool thing. Now, I'll clean this part up later, but let's keep going. So, uh, i got some other random cartridges here. This is a, an original Game Boy game based on, I guess, Tamagotchi. Um, this was 50 cents. That's the only reason I bought it, because it was super cheap and just looked weird. I'm not really one for Game Boy stuff in general. I just kind of liked it because um, my buddy had actually been actively looking for this, but everywhere we found it, it uh, didn't have this plate on it. There's, there's a battery underneath that, and the button on the side here was usually ripped off. And I found two of them, uh, basically 50 cents a piece. Uh, and so I bought him one, and then I bought myself one, just kind of just whatever, just to have. So there you go. I didn't even know it was a Tamagotchi game until I got it back home and tested it out. That's how little I cared. I just thought it was just cool looking. A um, couple of games I actually really wanted for the longest time. First off is Transformers Mystery of Convoy. It should be Convoy, but it says Convoy. Um, this is a Transformers Generation 1 game based loosely on Transformers the movie from 1986. I have always been perplexed as to why this game never came out in North America for the NES. Transformers and the NES were both at their height of popularity at the exact same time. The fact that this game was made and never released says something. I'm just not sure what that is. Um, I know this game sucks balls. This is a bad, bad game. And I, that's the only reason I can think of that they never released it. Because Nintendo of America might have thought, like, look, man, kids are really going to hate this game. Maybe we shouldn't do that to them. Um, but this is the same company that allowed LJN to make all sorts of garbage for that platform. So, I don't know, man, but uh, it, it is strange to me this never came out. 
I, funny enough, did see this in Osaka a few times, but I always passed on it. And I don't know why I did. Maybe it was because it was like five bucks. But in this case, I found it in one of those like junk bins for like a buck. So I was like, done, deal. But this one, though, as much as I love Transformers, I was actually way more excited about this one because I know that one's not really worth shit. This one's actually a legit good game, and it's really, really legitimately shocking to me that this was never released here. Uh, this is Super Sentai Jurenja. For those who don't know, Super Sentai Jurenja was actually Mighty Morphin Power Rangers that we got, but in Japan. They got it a few years earlier, and it featured uh, Japanese actors, of course, doing all the martial arts and all the, the zords and the fighting and all that stuff. But at the same time, they also had all the human interaction scenes with Japanese actors. When they brought that here, they kept all the zords and fighting and stuff, but they cut out all of the actors and replaced them with American actors. Um, so. It always perplexed me, once I found out this game existed, why we never got it. Because, yes, the NES was in its, you know, was basically in its complete decline by the time that uh, the show blew up. But at the same time, there was like one year of crossover, like 93, 94. I, I just never understood why they didn't release this here in that time. I mean, Money More for Power Rangers games came out on everything under the sun. Um, so I can only help but wonder what actually caused it. Uh, a couple of theories, I mean, yes, it has Japanese text in it, but uh, hello, we've been able to translate stuff for a long time. Um, also, there are, like, little pictures and scenes of other characters from the Japanese show that never appeared in the American show. Maybe that was part of it, but I also think they probably could have fixed that. The best theory, though, that I have, and this is probably the most accurate one, is a simple licensing issue. This game was made by some company called Angel. I've never heard of them before. Whereas Bandai ended up doing all the games in North America and Europe, all the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers specific games. It's very possible they simply never got past that licensing issue. Because it just perplexes me. Like, this, a Mighty Morphin Power Rangers game on the NES would have made money. Especially, you just bring this game over there, a couple of tweaks, you would have made some cash. I'm just, I'm surprised they never managed to pull that off. But regardless, have the Japanese one. Very happy to have it too, because it's an expensive game. It's usually like a forty to eighty dollar game. Um, I remember seeing it in Osaka with my buddy James. Uh, we found it for like forty five. I've seen it online for like eighty. Fucking hard off in the junk bin for two bucks. Great to have that. Next up, I uh, got a couple of Famicom Disk System games. Uh, this one was actually recommended to me by my buddy while I was there. Um, this is called Famicom Grand Prix F1 Race. He described it as like the spiritual precursor to Mario Kart simply in the sense that it's Mario in a racing game, like he's in an F1 car. I don't think it has, I haven't been able to play it because I don't have a functional Famicom disc system, but uh, basically the similarities would just be that. <laughs> I don't think there's any like, you know, they fire the red shells or any kind of crap like that. I think it's just Mario in a racing game. But one could argue that the genesis of that series was actually from this game, not necessarily from the Super Nintendo game itself. But I, I don't know for sure, but uh, that was enough for me to be like, yeah, I'll pay two bucks or whatever for that, that's fine, I don't care. Um, the other Famicom Disk System game I got, which I was much more excited about, purely for collector's reasons, this, Super Mario Bros. 2. Now, I'm sure a lot of you know this story, but in the event that you don't, uh, Super Mario Bros. 2, uh, well, after Super Mario Bros. blew up on the NES and on the Famicom, it was logical that Nintendo was going to make a second one. Uh, so Nintendo of Japan produced this game, and they decided to use it to push the Famicom Disk System hardware, or at least that was part of the goal. Um, but in North America, when they were, you know, about to bring the game over, they shipped this to them. They said, yeah, go ahead, try it out. That's the next one. Nintendo of America was like, mm, no, <laughs> they didn't want this game. The, game. the reason is, this game is extremely similar to the first one. Like, really, really similar, but at the same time, a lot harder. And they felt like, we will destroy our franchise with this game because it's just too hard for kids to play. That's how they felt. So they decided not to use it. And instead, they kind of dug through the assets of Japan's unclaimed uh, Nintendo IPs, and they found one called Doki Doki Panic. Uh, Doki Doki Panic was a game produced by Miyamoto, produced by Nintendo, in celebration of some sort of uh, event that Nintendo was doing, or some sort of celebration in Japan. The game was just tied to that. Um, but the actual game mechanics and everything was theirs. They just didn't own the characters. So what they decided to do was say, look, nobody in the West is going to know that franchise or any of that stuff. What we should do is take that game, reskin it completely with Mario characters, and release that as Super Mario Bros. 2. It's because of that that Super Mario Bros. 2 is usually considered the worst of the three in that trilogy in the West, because it's just an oddball game. But it was them essentially trying something new without actually trying something new. Um, in Japan, though, they eventually took our version of Super Mario Bros. 2 and brought it back as Super Mario USA and put that out on the Famicom. 
Uh, and this version of the game wasn't released in North America until Super Mario All-Stars on the uh, Super Nintendo. But I always thought it'd be cool to have the actual Super Mario Bros. 2 right here. Um, so in this case, I found it with the plastic exterior. It has the manual. It's complete and everything. It was basically, it was like 10 bucks, which is not an amazing price, but it's still pretty good, all things considered. So I was just happy to have that for the collection. Uh, next up, I got this. This is Mahjong for the Sega SG-1000. You know that great, uh, that great Mahjong franchise we're all in love with. What is the deal with Mahjong, man? Like, people love that shit? I, just, I don't get it. But they, good for them. Um, now, you're like, what, okay, why? What did you get that for? Well, this, this story goes back a little bit. Um, before I went to Japan the first time this year in Osaka, um, a guy uh, named Levi Roach sent me a Sega SG-1000 which was actually Sega's first home console. Uh, and I was like, holy shit, uh, at the time, I was amazing, I'm gonna go to Japan anyway, I'm gonna tr see if I can find any games for this thing. And I did my best to round up whatever I could, but it was all like loose cartridges, and generally not a very good price for them, like, you know, okay prices, but nothing really worthwhile. Um, so I, the same logic applied when I went out this time, I was like, anything for the SG-1000 I don't have, if it's cheap, I'm gonna pick it up. This was the, there was only two games I ever found, this one and another one that I already had. But in this case, because I, A, I didn't have the game, and B, because it had a manual, it's complete, uh, in a box, it was like nine bucks. I was like, done, I'm gonna do that. That's, I mean, yeah, I didn't wanna pay nine dollars for a Mahjong game from 1983, sure, but at the same time, it's for a platform that never came out outside of Japan and technically New Zealand. So, uh, very cool to have that. Plus, it's just neat to like have a boxed SG-1000 game from Sega's first platform ever. So, there you go, or first home console ever. Uh, and now onto their last home console ever. Uh, it's very rare that I get to pick up any Dreamcast stuff, uh, just because I have most of it. I know, first world problems. But um, in this case, there was a couple of items I saw that I was like, oh shit, that's cool. Because one thing I was always kind of laxed on was the Japanese exclusive accessories. Because uh, there's a lot of them, and you know, by the time I got around to that, it was just like, I'll pick the better ones. Um, but since I was actually there, you can kind of, you know, more easily acquire them for less money. Uh, in this case, I picked this up. This is the Dreamcast keyboard. Now, as you're, I'm sure a lot of you are aware, the Dreamcast had multiple keyboards out here, but in, in North America, they were the bigger, more standard keyboard that we use. In Japan, they typically use smaller keyboards for stuff. Now, I actually have one of the small keyboards, but it was specific to the Divers 2000 Dreamcast. This is just the vanilla regular one. Um, and it usually sells for like 30, 40 bucks online. Um, they had it for eight bucks. And the box is a little sun faded, yes, but the item is essentially brand new. Um, when you go inside, I mean, I looked at it already, it was in good shape. And uh, it was one of those things where, um, I know I just sniffed it, but there's a reason for that. If anybody who buys Japanese products uh, relatively often knows, when you open up Japanese stuff, there's this odor. I wouldn't describe it as good or bad, it's just a very particular scent that you'll recognize. Typically that's associated with new Japanese stuff. And this has that, which leads me to believe this thing has been sitting there basically sealed for, you know, years. Um, so it's in, it's in amazing shape as a result of it, minus the box, which is just a little sun faded. So eight bucks, not going to complain about a cool Dreamcast peripheral I didn't have. Speaking of another Dreamcast peripheral I didn't have, I got this. This is the Godzilla Edition VMU. I remember seeing this thing when I was a kid on pictures and stuff, and I was like, that's awesome that they would just get that, because I'm a big Godzilla fan, and of course a big Dreamcast fan, so like the idea of combining the two of them is awesome. This VMU in particular um, had like special Tamagotchi features, it has like a special Godzilla save on it that was compatible with a game called Godzilla Generations, and I guess you would use them together to do all sorts of weird Tamagotchi stuff, which was really popular at the time. Um, the VMU itself I always found amusing because the lettering it uses is for the American Godzilla movie from 98. I was like, why of all the things would you pick that one? But um, yeah, that was, that was strange because they, they really don't like that movie over there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's complete, although it's clearly been opened before, but whoever opened it obviously took good care of it because the, the VMU itself is in pristine shape. But clearly, like, the backing, like, it just slides right up like that. So it's clearly been, like, opened before, which, you know, I have no illusions that this thing was sealed or anything like that. But, uh, yeah, for nine bucks, that's all it's cost. And I was like, that's so cool, so cool to have it complete like that. So I picked that up. I'm not usually one for the VMUs uh, for the Dreamcast, collecting those, because Japan went nuts with those things. There's, like, way too many of them. Um, but in this case, Godzilla fan, it was right there in my face, complete, getting it. Um, next thing I got was a super rarity, um, something I was very excited about, 
But the person I was hanging out with was more excited about it, um, debatably. Uh, so, uh, like I said, I was hanging out with a buddy of mine named Fox. And he didn't get to go to stores with me nearly as often as I would have liked him to, but, you know, he had other things he had to do. So there was a couple of times when he actually got to go. Now, if you're ever out game hunting with a buddy of yours, there are certain rules that apply. The most important one is that whoever sees it first has dibs. Those are the rules. You don't get to just jump on an item that you like just because the other person saw it too. Like, um, if, you know, I, I'm, you understand basic logic. You can't, like, the guy can't, your buddy can't see it, point it out to you, and then you run over and grab a clerk and say, it's mine, I, I want to get it. You can't do that. It's a dick move. Don't do that. There are rules. So in this case, um, he saw a couple of things that he wanted, that he liked, and that means those are his. He makes that call. And if he decides he doesn't want them, then I could get him if he wants me to, or if he's okay with that. Um, so in this case, uh, he was looking at a few different items, and he saw a Game Boy Advance SP Famicom Edition, and then he saw the thing that is sitting right here. And he was basically debating on which of the two he was going to get, because they were the same price, and he decided he was only going to spend money on one of them. So while I, of course, wanted him to pick the Game Boy Advance SP so that I could get this, um, I didn't try to encourage one way or the other. I was like, it's your call, man, whatever you pick. Um, and so I rounded up all my items, and then eventually he made his decision. He decided to go with the Game Boy Advance SP, leaving this open, which he made very clear to me. He's like, this is something special, and the fact that this is just sitting here is amazing. Uh, you have to understand that this this was the store I mentioned in the earlier part of the video where we had to like climb up a mountain and then we we're on top of this mountain where there's like this little suburban village then you go down to a valley and there's like more people down there and it's like it's so out of the way like it just must have rounded up everything in that area which is why we think this was in there but what we got here was the Super Game Boy 2 now the Super Game Boy 2, you probably heard of the Super Game Boy at some point. Basic concept is simple. It's a cartridge you put in your Super Nintendo or Super Famicom, and it allows you to play your Game Boy games on it. Now, we got that in North America, and they got it in Japan, like a regular gray one. I even picked it up when I was in Osaka. But uh, the Super Game Boy 2 was much less well known. Um, it had additional features. Obviously, it's blue, transparent, plastic like that. They added link cable support, presumably for Pokemon compatibility. Um, it also can support the Game Boy DX games, meaning there were certain Game Boy games that had extra lines of code uh, that made them more capable in a Game Boy Color. Um, they, that happens to work with these. It has, a, and I guess there were some additional features, like it's, it is actually better at creating more accurate color palettes for a lot of games, stuff like that. Um, but it's extraordinarily uncommon. It came out very, very late, uh, and in Japan only, and in very limited quantities. Um, we think the reason it was so cheap, it was only 30 bucks, we think the reason it was so cheap was that they probably thought it was the first version. They probably just looked up Super Game Boy, saw regular ones, because the regular ones in the box are actually really not hard to find. But I've never in my life seen one of these in person before, and certainly not in the box. Um, even looking it up online, I found loose cartridges of it for a lot more than this, and I never saw ever one of them in the box. This one was not only in the box, it's got the manual, it's got everything, the, the cartridge is in incredibly good shape. It kind of comes off like someone bought it a long time ago for collector's purposes, and then it sat there, and then eventually someone just dumped it into hard off for whatever reason, and now here it is in my hands. Um, but yeah, it works perfectly, it's great. Uh, no issues whatsoever. Um, so very, very cool pickup to get. And thank you, Fox, for passing on it. Like I said, it was completely his choice. I didn't try to push him into anything. He, he decided to limit himself to one or the other, and he picked the other, leaving this open. He said, yeah, go for it. It's all you. So I got his permission, hence I have it here. Super Game Boy 2 in my hands, and in good hands, because I'm going to take good care of it. Um, next up, uh, this was kind of an oddball item I wasn't expecting to find. I was at, a, obviously, a different hard off. Um, and after I, I bought a whole bunch of things at a different hard off, including like the Dreamcast keyboard and some of this stuff, um, I, after I bought it all, uh, I noticed next to the, the register there was this big bin of controllers. And uh, it would have been, I guess, rude to start digging through all those controllers while the guy's like ringing stuff up, so I just kind of let him finish. And once he was done, I had all my things. Uh, I basically like just started digging through the controllers. Now it wasn't like behind the counter. I didn't like go back there or anything. It was out in front. It was in the public area. It was just clearly like they were in the process of going to take it somewhere. Um, so it was new inventory. Now the only reason it caught my attention at all, and this is ironic, is I saw a whole bunch of Wiimotes on top. Now, I don't care about the Wii. I don't care about Wiimotes, but I knew that meant video game stuff. 
So I started digging through it, and there was a lot of commons, a lot of Super Famicom controllers, Saturn controllers, stuff like that. But dug all the way to the bottom, and I found some treasure. I found a Neo Geo AES or Neo Geo CD controller. This, this, this controller works on both. Now, the, as you, if you collect or even know anything about like retro games and Neo Geo stuff, these are not very common. Um, they're more common in Japan because it was more popular there, but uh, I've never seen one of these in person, never even held one before. Um, but I, I have a Neo Geo AES. I've had one for years. I've always used the arcade stick. I've never had the actual controller. So to have one now is fantastic. Um, it's a really nice controller. I, I really like this clicky deal that they've got there. I wouldn't call it a D-pad or a joystick. It's like a weird combination idea because, you know, fighting games was very significant for the Neo Geo platform. Um, but very, very cool to have that. And if you saw my Super Potato video, you know I picked up a Neo Geo CD. One of the things that was wrong with it didn't have a controller. So that was a nice little... Uh, it was very serendipitous to have this happen as well, even though I still don't have a power supply for that damn thing, so I can't actually use it. But still, cool to get that. Uh, and this was 30 bucks, um, which was more than I would want to spend on the controller for something that old, but at the same time, given how unbelievably uncommon it is, and what I checked eBay, I could see that it was usually sells for a hell of a lot more. I was okay with it. Um, so that's not quite the end, just quite the end of the table here. We got a few more items, so let's take a look. Um, it wouldn't be hard off without picking up some hardware. And I don't mean just the controllers. I got a couple of consoles. Uh, I got this. This is a PC Engine Core Graphics 2. Uh, and of course it came with a controller, also has the power supply and all that stuff. This was at the same hard off where we got the Super Game Boy 2. I believe this was $30. Um, the Core Graphics 2, you'll have to forgive me, I'm not huge into the PC Engine scene, so there, there are things about it I, I very clearly and openly admit I don't know. But I believe the version, this is basically the same white PC Engine, they made various changes to it. It does feel noticeably heavier. It has this like uh, magnetic plate on the back that you know, for a clip there. And instead of RF out, it has AV out. Um, I do not believe this would support RGB, but I do know, because I tested it, that the AV Engine block, uh, which is a third party device, I did a video on a while back, does work on this thing. It fits in the back and you get RGB out of the console, it looks great. Um, thing works perfectly, and I, I believe it was like thirty dollars. It was a uh, pretty good deal because I had seen these around at different book offs and, and hard offs, and they were usually like seventy to eighty. So I was really surprised. Um, so I was like, "Yeah, that'd be dumb not to pick that up." So I went ahead and got that. Um, and then I got a couple other devices here. One that I've wanted for a long time, but just never pulled the trigger on, uh, which is this: a Famicom or Sharp Twin Famicom. Um, this is another rare example, much like the Sufami Turbo, where Nintendo decided to play nice with a different hardware company, in this case, Sharp. Now, I don't know exactly what motivated this, but for whatever reason, Nintendo allowed Sharp to build their own version of the Famicom and the Famicom Disk System and put them all into one console. Um, now, I found this at a hard off for 10 bucks, but it was in the junk bin. Now, I, if you've seen some of my other videos, I, I kind of explained this, but I'll explain it again. The Japanese definition of a junk bin, very different than ours. Ours actually means it's broken. Theirs means there's something mildly wrong with it, and they don't want to deal with it. And what I mean, I'll give you a good example of what I mean. A lot of these N64 games came from the junk bin. Do you know why they were there? Because they were dirty. If they were dirty, you put them in the console, it didn't work right away, okay, it's junk. Or, granted, Sin and Punishment wasn't one of those. But um, for the most part, that's typically what it means. It just needs some maintenance, and it's not worth their time or effort to do it. It's not that they don't understand that. They do. They understand it's not that difficult to repair. It's just not worth their time. And especially when a lot of their stuff is catered to foreigners, they lack the language skills in English to be able to articulate basically the minutia of what's wrong with it. It's not worth it. So they just label it as junk because they don't want you being pissed off if there's like a minor issue with it. Americans are notorious complainers and they don't want to put up with it. It's broken. It's junk. Just go away. We admit it up front. It's junk. Well, it's not really junk. So I took a gamble. I wanted to see how badly it actually was junk. Um, because I figured even if it really doesn't work, for 10 bucks I could clean it up and at least have it as a nice display piece. Um, so I picked one that happened to have a power supply. I did a little bit of research and I realized that was a really smart move on my end. I just got lucky with that because I just picked that at random. I was like, oh, that was a power supply. Maybe it's, it's a better shot. I don't know. Um, I got back only to realize that the power supply for this thing is incredibly particular. Um, the, even though the port on the back is like the exact same port that appears on like a ton of things, including like the, the core graphics right there, um, it uses a completely different output. Um, as a result, yeah, this uses DC, whereas like everything else uses AC, and it uses a very particular voltage. Um, as a result, the power supplies that come with these things are usually worth more than the consoles. <laughs> so that was good. 
Um, if you try putting anything else into it, you can potentially fry it. Uh, so having the original power supply is a good idea because it won't do that. And I was concerned that maybe that's what had happened. Someone else had stuck, like even the irregular Famicom power supply, you put that one of these, you'll toast it. Um, so I was worried that, oh shit, maybe that's what's wrong with it. Maybe that's why it's junk. Someone had toasted it by accident at some point. So I decided to test it out. Um, I used a step-down converter uh, just to be safe um, from 120 volts here in North America down to 100 volts, which is what they use in Japan. I just used one of those. Used the actual power supply, tried turning it on, but fuck, nothing happened. Like, nothing at all. It didn't do shit. And I was like, oh, damn, all right, it really is junk. And then I kept tinkering with it for a little bit, and then I realized the actual problem. The composite port on the back is slightly loose. Um, and what that means is it works, you just kind of have to finick with it a little bit, and once you do, suddenly the game started working. Um, uh, the Famicom games, I put Power Rangers in there, or Jude Rangers. I put that in and it worked just fine. The controller works fine, all, I was able to play it, no problem. Then I was able to, once I had it working like that, I switched over to the um, disk system mode, and the, the BIOS for that came up and that worked just fine, but it couldn't actually play games. Now the reason for that, I'm betting you, is that the belt in there is basically needs to be replaced because that's extremely common with disk systems. But essentially, for 10 bucks, I got an almost entirely functional Famicom Twin Sharp, or Sharp Twin Famicom, just basically needs the, re the belt replaced. Like, yes, it'd be nice to fix the composite so it's a little bit more reliable, but honestly, this wouldn't be the ideal way to play Famicom games anyway, or even Famicom disk system games. If you want to use like the EverDrive on an HDMI modded NES, That'll work and it'll look a lot better. This is more of a collector's piece, but knowing that it actually works is great too. Um, there's multiple colors of these too, ever if you're ever interested in one. But yeah, I got the one that came with the power supply and it ended up working out pretty well. So that's cool. And then finally, I got one last uh, console here. I got the PC Duo. Um, now in, uh, or sorry, the, uh, yeah, no, it's PC Duo. Because in the West, it's the Turbo Duo. It came with its controller. Now the Turbo Duo is much more valuable, let's not kid ourselves, because it barely came out here and it's, it's rather sought after. In Japan, the, the PC Engine Duo is not common, but it's, it's not nearly as sought after. But it was, it was relatively cheap, so I decided to pull the trigger on it. Um, it is the only way I would have to play any sort of CD games for the platform, uh, as you can see, because it can play PC Engine CD games as well as the actual cartridges, or, or cue cards. Um, though I have to feign ignorance on this one. I, I turned it on, I powered it up, it worked just fine. Um, it played the, the cartridges or hue cards perfectly fine. It was able to spin discs, but it couldn't load anything. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't work because I honestly don't know. I know that, well first of all, I don't have any PC Engine or PC uh, Engine CD game, so that really didn't matter. I couldn't test a game. All I tried to do was test a music CD, and it would spin it and detect it, but wouldn't play it. Now, I don't know if it's supposed to be able to do that, so I don't know. Um, and because I don't have any actual games, I don't know. But I also know that these things typically require some sort of cartridge or hue card that allows them to switch over or something like that. I feign complete ignorance when it comes to this, so I'm asking for uh, any advice. If anybody knows what I'm supposed to do to have this thing play disc-based games, I'd love to know that. Um, that'd be great. But yeah, I was happy to pick one of those up as well. So yeah, I did it pretty well. That was pretty cheap too, because again, hard off. Um, again, some, it was one of those junk bands, you know, so you're just like, oh shit, okay, cool. So that's the risk you take, um, and, but I could have gotten so much more crap there, but I decided to pick stuff I didn't have. Like, there's no reason, like, as, as tempting as it can be, when you see these, like, Famicoms that are sitting there, and like, five bucks or four and a half dollars or something like that, you're like, fuck, I want to pick that up just for that, because it's so cheap. I don't really need that. I have a Famicom, you know? But, so I focused more on stuff I didn't have. Maybe at some point if I go completely insane and I'm ever back there, maybe I'll go crazy and buy like 80 Famicoms for no reason. Doubt it. I'm not a reseller. But anyway, uh, yeah, Hard Off is the best. Uh, if you ever get the chance, please check it out. Uh, I want to thank you very much for watching this video. Hopefully you watched the Book Off video and the Super Potato video and maybe even that Shenmue like video. If I, I probably didn't mention that one enough times. Um, I was in the actual Dobuita Street in Yokosuka. Uh, which is where Shenmue takes place, and I got to do a video there, which is really cool. So, yeah, you guys should check that stuff out if you haven't already. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you all later.